Thank you very much, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, so my talk is titled, uh, There is no magic food tree, uh, healthy and sustainable diets now and in the future. And uh, as uh, you all know, it's very important to cite your sources. And my source, of course, is our current uh, Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, who in June 2017, in answering a question on why a nurse had, was receiving the same pay that she had been since 2009, said, ah, but there is no magic money tree. So I've slightly stolen her idea uh, to say, actually, there is no magic food tree and resources are, uh, are dwindling. Uh, but uh, you'll all know, of course, that there is the famous pasta tree, uh, which was, uh, there was a panorama program in 1957, so 60 years ago, about a tree that produced pasta. Uh, it was on the 1st of April, also known as April Fool's Day, um, but uh, unfortunately that doesn't exist either. So my talk today is going to cover these topics. Uh, a very brief introduction to the global nutrition situation. I'm the head of nutrition here at the London School. Very fortunate to be here since 2001. In fact, I did my master's here in 1992, uh, so I've been around the block for some time. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you very briefly about the global nutrition situation. Uh, it is what keeps me up at night, thinking about the issues uh, uh, around nutrition. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about diets and, and dietary guidelines. I'm going to talk about the environmental impacts uh, or, or on food production. So as the environment changes, what are the impacts going to be on food production? I'm going to talk briefly about the uh, idea of sustainable diets and finally some of the future challenges. And I've pitched this talk at a sort of public engagement level. And I hope you'll excuse that. So what I've done throughout is I've provided the references and the citations if you want to go and look up the very clever work that, the, uh, that our team does, not me, but the, other t the rest of the team that they do. Uh, so all the references are there for you to look at. But I've tried to pitch it at a level which is going to be accessible to all. And I think this is because it's, it's critically, I've done this because it's really important that we get better at engaging uh, on uh, with people who aren't from our disciplines and aren't from our sectors. So I hope at the, uh, at the end you'll be able to tell me whether you've felt that I have engaged with you uh, and whether or not uh, it was a success or whether I should let someone else from the team speak next year. So uh, as I said, a brief introduction to global nutrition situation. I'm going to start with the issue of undernutrition. Uh, these are the latest numbers from the UNICEF WHO World Bank report. Uh, suggesting that globally there are 52 million children under the age of five who are wasted. That means they're dangerously thin and at, at extremely increased risk of mortality. There are 155 million children on the planet under the age of five who are stunted. That means they're very short. It's estimated that 45% of all deaths in children under the age of five are associated with undernutrition, which adds up to more than three million deaths per year. So that is still the situation. It's not a situation of 30, 40 years ago. That is the situation today. These are horrific numbers, uh, and many people in the nutrition group are working towards tackling these. This is a really significant problem. Of course, short-term risks of undernutrition are enormously increased risks of mortality and increased susceptibility to infectious diseases and morbidity. And the longer-term effects are lower educational achievement, reduced work capacity and reduced economic productivity. So undernutrition blights the lives of family, individuals, families, uh, but of course whole countries as well. Uh, so what can be done? It's always important that, that we don't post the doomsday scenario. What can be done? Uh, there was a series of papers in The Lancet in uh, 2013 which listed a set of interventions which, uh, which, if delivered at 90% coverage, would reduce stunting by 20% and would reduce mortality by 15%. So there are some solutions, but as you can, as you can see, there's still quite a lot of work to be done uh, to tackle the remaining 85% uh, of stunting and mortality. And of course, simultaneously, whilst we talk about undernutrition, we also need to talk about the emerging threats at the other end of the spectrum, which is the spectrum of uh, overweight and obesity. And of the five billion adults on the planet at the moment, it's estimated that two billion, so two out of five, are overweight or obese. There are currently estimated to be 41 million children uh, under the age of five who are overweight. And uh, for example, one in 12 adults on the planet has, has type two diabetes. So we have a food system that is neither delivering the right, sufficient uh, uh, 
uh, diets nor, uh, nor diets of, dis of sufficient quality. Um, and we have a food system, therefore, which is not working for global population health. Uh, and the global burden of disease nicely reflects this. If you look at the largest, the causes of disease, the risk factors for disease, uh, and this is in Daly's Disability Adjusted Life Years, child and maternal mortality, of course, at the very top, uh, contributing about 20% of global Daly's, and dietary risk factors are at 15%. And you can see that high blood pressure, uh, a high fasting plasma glucose, high body mass index are all associated with diets. So there's something wrong with what we're eating. There's something wrong with the diets that the food system is delivering to us and the foods that we're choosing to <coughs> eat. So what does the world eat? This is a fantastic book if any of you get a chance to see it. Uh, uh, I think there's a copy in the library, but it's, a really, it's also on the web. It's a very nice book, and it gives us very nice images of what people around the world <coughs> eat, uh, are eating. Uh, and every single nutrition professor on the planet uh, uses these slides. Uh, so I'm just going to pop a couple up, cup, a couple of them up. This is Ecuador, so there's still many, many people on the planet who eat diets that look like this, largely uh, <coughs> vegetable, uh, largely uh, 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 home-produced, um, but, but increasingly, of course, diets look like this. This is the UK diet. Uh, we have some things at the front that masquerade as chocolate. Uh, we have quite a lot of cats and dogs who have to be fed in this country. And we have these things which are quite rarely spotted in UK diets, which are called fruits and vegetables. Uh, they're there somewhere if you can see them. Uh, they are more rarely spotted in US diets. Uh, I'll give you a prize if you can find a vegetable there. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's, it's, I'm making a point here. And the point, of course, is that diets globally are shifting, Glides, diets are shifting very fast, the power of the food industry is enormous, and in fact Bolivians are also <laughs> buying food which is processed, heavily processed, or Ecuadorians or wherever, are also buying food that's heavily processed, heavily packaged, and heavily coloured, as they are here. So what should we be eating? Of course we should be eating foods according to the, this is the Public Health England, Department of Health Eat Well Guide, and you can see that this diet contains large amounts of potatoes, breads, rice, pasta, large amounts of fruits and vegetables, significantly smaller amounts of animal source foods, and <coughs> beans and pulses, and dietary, or, uh, dairy and other alternatives, and tiny amounts of oils. Um, so who in this room actually does follow the Eat Well Guide? That would mean that 40% roughly of your plate would be cereals, grains and potatoes, 40% would be fruits and vegetables, 20% would be meat, fish, beans and dairy. So that's actually quite hard to do, um, and this line is almost impossible to do. Uh, the Eat Well Guide says yes, that you have tiny amounts of oils, chocolates, cakes and crisps. So that is what the, uh, w uh, the, the Public Health England recommends that we should be eating. So why do we eat what we do eat? And the great Srinath Reddy has said that there are three uh, main drivers of, of food choice. And they are that, that food choice is either uh, conscious, you're making a conscious decision about what you eat. It is conditioned, uh, it's conditioned by culture or it's conditioned by advertising or it's conditioned by an external factor which is making you choose those foods. Or of course it's constrained. And in many parts of the world, uh, what we eat is constrained by our resources uh, and uh, in, the, in the broadest sense. So, but you could imagine that mothers might want to make some decisions about what they feed their children to make them grow up healthily. How are those decisions made? Some of those are going to be made because their mother-in-law, as is my mother-in-law, stands behind me saying what I should do. Uh, <coughs> and so there are those, there are those uh, uh, forces. <coughs> there are constrained choices, and, and often that's because of vulnerability or, or, or poverty or whatever. These are older people, of course, in, 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 uh, in, in, a, in a home. Uh, there are enormous cultural reasons for choosing the food you eat, and of course, I couldn't resist a slide having a dig at students who eat pizza and drink beer all day long. But uh, that's what I used to do. Uh, but we eat for, we have a variety of choices uh, to make uh, in in uh, in uh, in our diets. So, do we consider the environment when we're thinking about our diets? How much how much evidence is there that when we make choices around what we choose to eat? we think about the environmental consequences of our choices. So there was a very nice survey conducted in, 24, tw uh, uh, in 2017, which, uh, which was a telephone survey of 2,000 adults. 
uh, in the UK. And it asked them to make, to, to ask, ask the, the, uh, the respondents to uh, say what, what were the main causes, their main things shaping their shopping choices. So taste was obviously the most important thing. And more than 90% of people said they chose food for its taste. Cost was the next most important thing. Health was slightly less important. The ethics of the production of the food was substantially less important. And of course, environmental <coughs> factors were very unimportant for most people. So people, and this is obvious, when you think about the food you want to buy and you want to eat, taste is the most important thing. Cost is, of course, very, very important too. And then there are these other factors which determine what it is you decide to buy. So when we think about diets, of course, there is a link between diets and the environment. And so let's have a quick chat about what those links are. As a nutritionist, I was always encouraged, we have always been trained, we train people to think about the links between foods and diets and health outcomes. And that's the classic discipline of nutrition. Uh, what is the food we eat and how does it impact on our health? But, uh, but as we... As the discipline develops and public health and global health nutrition develops further, we need to think much more carefully about where that food comes from. Um, and that food, of course, comes from the food system. And the food system um, and our health are impacted by the environment in various different ways. And the, the environment might directly impact our health, but the environment might also indirectly uh, affect population health through the food system. And of course, the food system has a role to play <coughs> Uh, in, in, in affecting the environment. And that, that two-way bi-directional relationship is what I'm going to be focusing most of the rest of the talk on. So if it doesn't sound interesting, now's the time. <laughs> so let's just have a quick chat about what is the food system. So the food system goes all the way from the farm all the way to the processing plant, the warehousing, the shop, the kitchen, your mouth, and of course your dustbin or your, or your compost if you're very good. And that is the food system, but of course also included in the food system and when we discuss the food system are the policies, the financial resources and other resources and the institutions involved in shaping that food system and therefore the food that comes to us. So it's a very broad definition, um, but it's important to think about all those various factors. So how will, the ch how will a changing environment affect food production? Well, it's clear that uh, most scientists on the planet believe that, uh, global, that the global temperatures are increasing and, and there are of course various scenarios and various, uh, various pathways for that increase but it's estimated that uh, temperatures will increase by 2, 3, 4 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. Uh, global water uh, precipitation, rainfall, will change as well. And again, these, these changes are going to be quite large, particularly in some areas, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia will be significantly drier by 2050, <coughs> and whereas northern latitudes, the, the extreme latitudes in the north and the south will have a little more water. The World Bank in 2010 uh, estimated the impacts of these changes in temperature and rainfall on cereal yields, so only looked at the main cereals, wheat, rice, uh, uh, corn, uh, and, and estimated that, as you can see, uh, yields would decline substantially uh, in Africa, in parts of South America, in Australia, in parts of South Asia, and yields would increase in the northern latitudes of North America and North Northern Europe and parts of Russia. So, of course, uh, uh, um, as, as with many of these things, the hardest hit countries are the, least, the countries least able to, to, to respond to these changes. There's also some evidence uh, from Sam Myers's group at Harvard that suggests that this changing that the, that change in climate, and in this case, this is CO2 fertilization, so the uh, the increased yield of crops as a result of increased carbon dioxide levels in the air, will change the concentration of certain essential nutrients in crops, and in this case, zinc and iron, but also protein levels are, are, are thought to decline as well uh, as carbon dioxide levels increase. So we in the group here uh, are looking at the impact. So most of the work so far has been on cereal yields and cereal quality. And as nutritionists, actually, we're particularly interested in fruits and vegetables as well. <coughs> and we've been looking at the impacts on fruits and vegetables of changing environmental stresses. And we've conducted two pretty major systematic reviews in the group, 
looking at the impact of multiple environmental stresses on fruit and vegetable yields and qualities. And I'm going to show you some of the evidence we've generated. Uh, we've identified more than 180 studies from 40 countries. And we've looked at, uh, uh, Pauline has done these, and they're rather, uh, uh, I must try and remember. The top left hand one is uh, water quality, and then, of course, temperature. We have water quantity, uh, carbon dioxide, salinity, and ozone levels. So it's estimated that all of those things are going to change, uh, are changing already, but are going to change more in the future. And so we wanted to see what the evidence was that these things would, that those environmental changes would change the quantity and the quality of fruits and vegetables globally. So this is the evidence from vegetable yields. The evidence shows that from our systematic reviews, uh, uh, the evidence suggests that carbon dioxide, as we know, has a fertilizing impact and it'll increase the production. So many plants respond to increased carbon dioxide levels. And so carbon dioxide, increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will result in increased yields of vegetables. But for temperature, for water quantity, for ozone, for salinity, and for water quality, there's a uniformly negative impact of changes in these important environmental stresses on vegetable yields. And the evidence is pretty similar for fruit as well. So we are estimating, we are providing first ever estimates of the impact of envi multiple environmental stresses on vegetable yields. Vegetable quality, that's regarding nutrient quality of those uh, uh, within those crops, is quite a complicated story and differs, f and there's not very much evidence either. Um, but we have some very clear, uh, very clear uh, picture here that these stresses are going to have some negative impacts on available availability of vegetables and fruit. We also know that uh, uh, pollinator numbers are declining rapidly globally. So pollinators are the flies and the bees of this world who do a lot of work for us pollinating the many crops that are important, <coughs> which includes fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, coffee, uh, which is important to all of us, and grapes. Uh, and you can see there have been some estimates of the impact of a total loss of pollinators on the planet on, on, on health globally. Uh, which have been published in The Lancet a, lot, a couple of years ago. So people are looking at those, uh, those factors as well. So the, so the evidence is that the envir environmental changes that are predicted and that are underway and are predicted to happen more into the future are likely to have substantial impacts on the availability of the foods that we need to survive uh, healthily. What about the reverse direction? What about the impact of the food system on the environment? Well, I showed you this picture earlier of the food system, and I talked to it, and I said, you know, this is the, the food system very broadly. Well, at every single step in that food system, there are going to be environmental impacts. So in the farming sector, uh, the amount of fertilizer, the amount of manure, uh, the amount of what is being grown, whether it's crops or livestock on the land. Uh, once the food is produced, it goes to a factory for processing, typically goes to a factory for processing. What is the food? How is that food processed? Uh, what is there? It requires energy for cooling or the, pro the production, the packaging. It goes into warehousing, so that requires transportation. That's, that's uh, uh, the fuel required for the lorries, the fuel required to keep the fridges cold. It goes into a shop, of course, and then there's a large amount of waste in shops. It goes into the kitchen. Uh, there's a large amount of waste in our kitchen. The estimates are that about 10 or 15 percent of food that enters in the house, into the house is lost, is, is wasted. Uh, and of course, in, in, in restaurants and ho hotels, of course, that number is much more. So at every step, there is, a, there is an environmental impact. Um, and those impacts can be very large. So for greenhouse gases, of course, there are very, very large, uh, in the agriculture sector, very, very large impacts of agriculture on the environment, whether it's methane, nitrous oxides, uh, carbon dioxide, various different things affecting soil carbon, affecting soil nitrogen. And it's estimated that up to 30% of global <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions come from the agriculture sector. So we always think of planes and cars as the major emitters, but in fact 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. Uh, we Water use is, is enormously important in agriculture. Uh, the surface water, groundwater use in agriculture is the major source of global water withdrawal. And in some <coughs> countries, uh, there it's now be becoming almost impossible to grow uh, vegetables, uh, 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 fruit and vegetables. 
Uh, soil degradation is another major issue. The FAO had a, 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 a consensus last year on the importance of soils, uh, and soils are becoming much more uh, much much po poorer quality, which uh, reduces the ability to grow crops successfully. And of course, land use change is a major driver of greenhouse gas emissions, but also changing the habitats. And when we're thinking about world biodiversity, we can see that in uh, 2000, agriculture uh, uh, accounted for about uh, for about 30 percent of the loss of. Uh, I don't know what this figure shows me. Actually. <coughs> Uh, there's that number. That graph is wrong, isn't it? We should write to these people and tell them. <laughs> All right, let me do that. But anyway, as you can see from the graph, uh, there are major problems in agriculture. Uh, made, uh, agriculture is a major source of loss, loss in biodiversity, and that is going to increase. So you could say to yourself, well, is it all really that important? I mean, how important are these things? Surely the agriculture sector can respond. Surely uh, there are ways that we can, can, we can get around this. Well, we drew a, uh, a, a framework uh, which we published last year, uh, which looked at the, um, uh, which, which, which put these things together, because it's very easy to, to work in silos. It's very easy to work in health or to work in nutrition or to work in agriculture or to work in environmental change. But until you start putting these things in, I, together in a framework and thinking through how they are connected, you miss some of the big story. So we have the food system activities that I've talked about quite a lot on the bottom left there, We're talking about agriculture and consumption and all of those things. And we talked about the output of that, which is nutrition, health, nutritional health and well-being. We've talked a little bit about climate change and environmental stresses that are going to affect the food system. And then, of course, in the middle of that is the interventions and policies that will hopefully e help us, but could, of course, be a hindrance towards providing healthy and sustainable diets in the future. So linking those things together makes it more possible to think about the consequences. And let me give you an example. So the example comes from imagining the situation where fruits and vegetables become scarce because of the environmental changes that I've talked about, which leads to an increase in the price of those fruits and vegetables. What's the consequences of price rises for health? Food price rises. So this happens periodically. Food pr there, are food, there are spikes in the price of food. And this happened uh, rather tragically in 2009 and again in 2011, where, there's, where there were some substantial increases in the prices of food globally, which meant that the food basket globally was more expensive and people were having to make some pretty significant choices on what to eat and whether to eat at all. So the uh, FAO uh, estimated that, that the, food pr f the food price spike in 2009 uh, pushed the number of undernourished people on the planet to over a billion. So it significantly increased the number of people who were defined as undernourished. And the FAO definition of undernourished is having sufficient calories and dietary energy uh, to meet a certain level. Uh, so it's a slightly uh, complicated uh, uh, metric. But the evidence was that from, from FAO was that this had a substantial effect on the, availability and the possibility of people to feed themselves adequately. So that's, you can see, therefore, that increased prices leads to changing consumption patterns. But it does something else as well. And in two, between 2008 and 2012, there were riots in 22 countries as a result of food prices. So people went to the street. People took to the street to say, we cannot afford food anymore. And they went and they told their governments, we need some solutions, we need some policies, we need some support. So when you're thinking about these things uh, at a much larger scale, you have to be aware that a small change here might have a very large impact there. So these changes that we're talking about in changing availability of foods, li are, if, you th if you think about it within a framework which links into prices and to trade and to policies and to environment and therefore to social and economic prosperity and social unrest in this case, these issues can become very large very quickly. So solutions, of course, we look to the agriculture sector. So if I talk to my agriculture friends, they'll say, don't you worry, Alan, it'll all be fine because we're very clever people and we can come up with new crops and new varieties. So I've given two examples here. We have an agricultural innovation of a, of a sweet potato, which is enriched, which is specially selected to have more pro-vitamin A. Um, and, and therefore it, it is, it's orange flesh because of the all the, all the pro-vitamin A in it. And this, this, is, this has been demonstrated to have health benefits. 
Uh, and then on the right there, we have an example of a, of a rice that has been specially bred uh, to withstand flooding. So this is called scuba rice. Uh, it, it is a rice that's been specially bred that it can withstand when fully developed in seed, can, can withstand two weeks of flooding and not lose its crop. So it's a rather remarkable crop. And so these are the sorts of interventions and innovations uh, that are being developed to respond to the environmental changes that are underway. But we also need policies, and we need people to recognise, and we need policymakers to recognise the importance of actions in this area and to have a slightly longer time frames when they're thinking about these things. So climate change, uh, uh, environmental changes will take time. They will take time to play out. Uh, and we need to think about those policies now. And unfortunately, uh, we have some significant <laughs> challenges which, go, which are going to make that rather complicated. So what can we do? What can we do as, as you know, concerned <coughs> citizens? Well, we can start off thinking about <coughs> our own diets. So if you look at the WHO guidelines for diets, they suggest that we should have between 15 and 30 percent of our diets as fat, 55 to 75 percent of our diets as carbohydrates, and you can see those numbers there. So I've written in black uh, on the right-hand side uh, the UK, the, the, UK the, the, the data from the UK diet, uh, and you can see that all the numbers in black are where the UK diet meets WHO guidelines. <laughs> so uh, we have a pretty terrifically bad diet in the UK, um, and very few. We, you know, we eat too much fat, we eat too little carbohydrate, we eat too much sugar, um, and you can see we don't eat anywhere near fruit enough fruit and vegetables. So what we did in the group was we said, what would happen if we modified the diet and we we optimized the diet to make it look like a UK diet, but change things around so that it met the WHO recommended diet. So we estimated the green, uh, and we also, we also wanted to know what the greenhouse gas emissions of the diets were. And you can see that there's a vast diver diversity in greenhouse gas emissions associated with different parts of the diet. So we, we, we optimised the diet and we said, all right, well, currently we're eating this much red meat and, we, and the new healthy WHO diet would have a little bit less red meat. And you can see that vegetables would go up, cereals would go up, fruit would go up. And you can see, so we used some dietary optimization to do that. And we identified that this would result in <coughs> nearly 20% lower greenhouse gas emissions. Seven, and we estimated the health impact of this healthier diet. And it would lead to 7 million life years saved over the next 30 years. So this is one of those win-win situations where we're saying, OK, in the UK, we have a diet. If we change that diet to one which was healthy, according to WHO, then that would also have benefits for greenhouse gas emissions. So that would lead, uh, lead us towards this, this, this utopia of a sustainable diet. But of course, there are many questions around that sort of diet. So what are the effects on livelihoods of farmers in the UK or elsewhere? What are the effects on, on, on you know, is it publicly acceptable to, for me to say to you today, you've got to eat half the red meat you ate yesterday? Is that, are you going to do that? And what kind of policymaker do we need? What kind of person at the top do we need to enact these laws to say, all right, we are that significantly concerned about the environment that we're going to do something about what you're eating today? These are big questions. So if you are going to change your dietary <laughs> habits, what, what should you be doing? So I think for number one, you should be number one considering the environment when you're making your dietary choices, considering the environment. Then of course there's that other list of things that of course you know, <coughs> less meat, more fruit, more sustainably sourced fish, <coughs> less food waste. And I put question marks around so seasonal food and local foods because that's what people always go to and they say, oh, we must eat seasonally, we must eat locally. The evidence around those two things is patchy, let's call it. Um, and of course, we, perhaps we all should be eating less. I certainly need to go on a post-Christmas diet, so uh, maybe we should all be doing that. Um, and funnily enough, this diet, which we've just put up here, is the Eat Well Diet, the Eat Well Guide. So we are not diverging from government uh, policy at the moment. And of course, I'm always asked, should we all be vegan? Because why not? Why shouldn't we all be <coughs> vegan? It's obviously animal source foods that are the major contributor to <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions. And in fact, if you, and, uh, but also, uh, they're also major contributors to think like water footprints. So water footprints is the amount of water required for the production of foods. And you can see that, for example, it takes 15,000 litres of water to produce one kilogram of beef. 
it's quite a large amount. But notably, it also takes 9,000 kilograms of litres of water to produce a kilogram of nuts. So the vegan option isn't always the best option. <laughs> and, and, and this brings us to the next level of complexity. We've talked about greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but there are many, many, many other environmental impacts. We've talked about biodiversity, we're now going to talk a bit about water, um, but we're talking about uh, many things as well. So we've looked at diets in India, dietary patterns in India, using data collected here at the school, the Indian Migration Survey study. Um, and we identified <coughs> five distinct dietary patterns in India. Uh, in the north, they eat a lot of wheat. In the south, they eat a lot of rice. Some diets had meat in them. Some were strictly vegetarian. <coughs> so we identified these different patterns. Now, if you looked at the greenhouse gas emissions associated with those different diets, you would say, right, the diet that I want to eat is the wheat and pulse diet. It's obviously got the lowest emissions. That's the best for the environment. But sadly, that is the worst for water footprints. It has the highest water footprints because these crops are often irrigated in the dry season. They require a lot of water. And if you talk to Indian farmers, which I do, uh, because we're fortunate to have some projects in India, if you talk to Indian farmers, they'll tell you they don't know about greenhouse gas emissions, but they do know that they're having to travel further and pay more for their water to irrigate their crops. And that is the pressing issue for them. So what about future challenges? Obviously, the major challenge for us when we're thinking about the future of food systems is can we produce enough food? Uh, for the projected 9 or 10 billion people who will be on the planet in 2050. And this is a really big issue. The Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, says that yes, we can. It's not a problem at all. Don't you worry there about it at all. Uh, other people are slightly more skeptical. <laughs> Most of the modeling that has been done to date has been done for, for cereals. So we know we can produce enough cereals. Um, but we don't know if we can produce enough fruits and vegetables. And we also haven't really thought through the consequences for the environment of an, an enormous, almost a doubling in the production of cereals uh, on the planet by 2050. So that's a challenge. The second challenge, of course, is urbanisation. So if indeed it is the case that 70% of people, or it might even be 80% of people, will be living in cities in 2050, what exactly will they be eating? And who's going to produce that food for them? So there are really big questions about how will the food system function? You know that here in, the, in London we have warehouses all around the outside that bring food into the city. If there's a problem with that warehousing system or if there's a problem for some reason they can't come into the city, we have two or three days worth of food in London and then we're out. So there are really big questions around food security as we all move into cities. We have, uh, I should have also said, excuse me, on this, that the population is ageing as well, tremendously. So by 2050, there will be more than 20% of the population will be over 65, which also has an impact, especially when you're thinking about who's going to be doing this work, the agricultural work, often very labour intensive. And then, of course, the other so substantial challenge is the shift in diets, the so-called nutrition transition from a diet which is uh, highly based on vegetables <coughs> and, and uh, high-fibre vegetables and, and fruit to a diet which contains much more animal source foods, contains much more sugar, fat and salt. And it couldn't be more clearly demonstrated than this. I took this photo last year in India. Both of these dishes cost 100 rupees, so less than a pound. You can have an entirely vegetable and totally delicious vegetable tali on the left, or you can have a chicken Maharaja Mac, <laughs> uh, which I don't know whether it's delicious or not. It doesn't look great. Uh, but those both cost, Sorry, no, <laughs> those both cost 100 uh, rupees. So again, we need to be thinking about solutions. We need to be thinking about agriculture. Is the way we're doing agriculture the best? Should we be thinking more about, for example, drip irrigation rather than pouring water all over the fields, dripping it in very slowly? In, the, in London now, there are already places, this other the figure on the right is vertical agriculture. So this is people growing, uh, growing vegetables vertically indoors under lighting, uh, very controlled conditions, growing perfectly healthy, perfectly nice vegetables in that manner. Do we need to be thinking about alternative sources of foods? Of course, you'll all know about eating insects. Um, and this is, the, this is a laboratory-grown burger. 
Uh, the first laboratory grown burger was, was, was produced in 2013, cost about a quarter of a million pounds. Uh, 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 so not one for me, but, there, but it will become cheaper. And, and, and laboratory grown meat and meat alternatives uh, will be making, making, I'm sure, within the next 10 years, will be making, uh, uh, um, making themselves seen or not seen in processed foods all over the world. So the other challenge, of course, is that we've been set this challenge. We've been set this challenge by the UN. The UN and, uh, 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 has, has said we must end hunger by 2030, the, millennium uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goal, end hunger, achieve food security, <coughs> and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture by 2030. Are we ready to do that? Can we do that? The, the, the prize, of course, is enormous. I've talked about the impacts of undernutrition, talked about some of the impacts of overweight and obesity. The prize is enormous if we get this right. And it's not only enormous for SDG2 on hunger, but there are, of course, enormous linkages with the other sustainable development <coughs> goals on health, on clean energy, on poverty, on, on life below the water. And you can see multiple linkages. All of these SDGs are very heavily linked. So the opportunities are there. The opportunities are great. Um, uh, if we can, if we can pull it off. So I'll just finish uh, <coughs> with my final thoughts. Personal actions. We must stop taking food for granted. Food does not come from the supermarket. <laughs> food comes from a farmer who has worked jolly hard to produce a food which we're eating. So let's start not let's stop taking food for granted and let's start making informed decisions and making uh, taking informed actions. Uh, and then the academic opportunities, I've just presented a few of them, but they really are vast. But only if we start thinking in a different way. We need to start thinking across disciplines. We need to start thinking across sectors. We need to be linking in with new people, engaging. I now work with uh, Georgina Mace, University College London, the world expert on biodiversity. I work with Pete Smith in Aberdeen, who's the world expert on greenhouse gas emissions. The opportunities for working with new people are fantastic and really exciting. We need to be generating novel data, and we need to make sure that those data are policy relevant. Uh, you know, it's, we've, I think we're in a bit of a hurry here, so we need to be generating new data that <coughs> policymakers need, and that's about engaging policymakers from the very beginning to make sure that the data you're generating are what they want. And finally, we need to be lobbying. We need to be going out and talking to policymakers, policy shapers, getting involved, standing up and speaking, talking at events, making the opportunity, you know, making, make, letting people know <coughs> about these issues and making them aware of the potentials for the potential opportunities. So uh, finally, I'd like to thank, of course, our funders, the Wellcome Trust, are our major funder, and we have a new, a new program called CHEFS, uh, Sustainable Healthy Food Systems, which has just started, which is a major program working in the UK, in India, and in South Africa. Uh, we also have funding for the European Union. I have a list of uh, collaborators and partners in the team to thank. Uh, and I'll finish with that. Thank you all very much. Thank you.